So I wish you a very happy Nikolaus Tag and Krampus Nacht. I'll see you. <laughs> oh, that, that is absolutely fascinating uh, story about Krampus. And Baxter, hello. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, Krampus does actually look quite a lot like one of your babysitters. I I, it looks vaguely familiar. <laughs> well, well there's a character. <laughs> what was he called? Krampus. Krampus. Oh. Krampus, yeah, like the cramps. Right. Um, and he looks a bit like one of your babysitters who was, who was called the Strangler. Yeah, the sulfate strangler, to be exact. Yeah. The sulfate strangler. This, um, well, let me tell you, everyone, if you haven't read Baxter's book, it is absolutely brilliant. It's just so funny um, and it's so crisp uh, <laughs> and it's completely sort of lacking in self pity. Um, and I think uh, you, you do sort of appreciate the light and the dark, don't you? Because, I mean, your dad, the other thing, firstly, to celebrate is that I only sort of realized with the flash that, of course, you're the boy on new boots and panties. Yeah. So can everyone just let that sink in? Because um, I used to stare at that cover like, you know, uh, not like, absolutely nonstop. Um, so it sort of brought back all sorts of feelings uh, watching it again. You're the little sort of tough lad um, on the cover. I wasn't. Uh, sorry? I wasn't really tough then. <laughs> well, you, you, you look it. I've never been, really. Now, um, so tell us about The Strangler, for example, um, and that period in your life. I mean, you, as Victoria said, it was a sort of chaotic shelter. You leap around from place to place. Um, but there was one sort of relatively stable bit when your dad just basically abandoned you with this sort of um, stinky drug dealer. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it wasn't, it was smelly by default of size, but his intentions were, it was very obsessively clean. I mean, use a, a whole can of, deodorant and, and he was constantly washing and was so he's a strange um, bunch of contradictions but essentially he was a an ex-roadie that had become more of a kind of colorful sidekick and a and what they would refer to in those days as a minder and a minder i think in dad's world wasn't somebody that really had much purpose then to sort of enforce the the myth the drama the kind of the fact that dad was quite small and disabled and he sort of played on that and, and and he was a big it was a sort of part of the theatrical impact you know if you know what i mean so um so strangler was a roadie then he became a drug dealer and a and a person that would um drive people like dad or he i think he worked for freddie mercury and all sorts of people and he was a really funny lovely um mercurial strange person but full of as mu much um, kindness and funniness as, as darkness so and, and did, did your dad i mean he obviously attracted quite a lot of these characters and you say that he was sort of um he was sort of split in his own personality he was sort of torn between or he could sometimes be very sort of loving and caring and looking after people um and then also you know could get sort of quite angry and he, he could go through those three moods in or two or three moods in one day yeah, I mean, I think Dad's conditions, um, uh, what, what, where he'd got, what the reason he'd got where he'd got, and the, the background to his life was quite extreme. So mm. it, there was a sort of not justification, but there were reasons mm. as, a, as a sort of a journey behind his success was a sort of not wasn't um, a decision; it was a necessity to sort of survive his quite quite awful childhood and, and some of the things that happened to him um, but when, during that journey dad learned to sort of collect people and they and they sort of served him in a way you know these people were there to serve him and in another way dad mythologized people so strangler was real name was pete really and, he, and not to demote strangler but he was yeah. a bloke called pete that dad called the sulfate strangler to sort of turn him into a minotaur and um so you know you pete could just be quite an innocent large bloke <laughs> but I get it, but you know. Yeah, but so your dad sort of performed the kind of artistic alchemy on him and sort of transformed him into a sort of dramatic character in his life. Yeah, kind of. He sort of yeah. gave him credence and get he, he was a dad narrated his own surround, you know, he created his own fantasy in a way. Mm. Well, um, one of the people um, he picked up was uh, our mutual friend Jock Scott, who, if, if 
listeners don't know who and viewers don't know who that was. There is actually a video of me interviewing him on our YouTube channel. Um, and John, again, he was a sort of poet. Uh, he didn't produce that much poetry. Um, he was just one of those people who people love to have around. And I think your your dad was one of the first people to sort of uh, spot his sort of charm in a way. Yeah, he, apparently he he rolled up on the side of a tour bus in Edinburgh and he was a hod carrier or a painter and decorator or something and just got on the bus and said, I don't want to work anymore. I want to live a bohemian existence and never went back. And, and dad randomly threw me a 22nd birthday, not a 21st birthday, in a pub, in the, that big pub, the Jack Straws Castle, in, uh, up on the top of Hampstead. And um, it was 22nd or third or some random number. He ch and dad charged everyone a fiver to get in, all my mates a fiver to get in. And Jock did a poem called Socks about nicking my dad's socks. And it was the most amazing. He stood on a table and he did this incredible poem and his beautiful accent. And next door were, were the, the headmistress association having their annual <laughs> dinner. And they all got up and applauded. And <laughs> dad, the world that dad could create and the world that Jock could create in sort of random, spontaneous and brilliant situations. Well, that's, and it, what, was, what was so nice about, well, Jock, and obviously I didn't know your dad, but from, from what you say um, in the book, and it, it, it's sort of, um, it, is, it is the sort of, Good side of bohemianism where everyone's welcome it doesn't matter about your background um and in a way that there is a group of people defined by that thing that they, they don't want a, a normal job yeah yeah i mean I th yeah they don't they're definitely looking for an alternate way out or, and a kind of and people like that were kind of uh you know that he could he could control being living the opposite way around he could control that in himself due to his extreme upbringing and so they look for him with a certain leadership that he sort of authorized them to not do what you're supposed to do yeah. if that sentence makes any sense yeah I, I, I think i get that and um i saw that a bit meeting jay scrummel once or twice that he had a, a similar sort of collection of people around him who yeah. he, he sort of semi-supported um and they weren't always particularly easy people and no. you know, other people would be like i'm not quite sure why um you know jay scrummel would patronize that person in a way but um but i think there was sort of there's something it's not exactly charitable but um there's well, something sort of well, kind, with, dad, you know? with dad it was a pact you know you saw yeah. that it was a bit absurd you were you were in service right okay is it, and i think it's, maybe it's because it's when when someone feels uh they're successful and they feel a little bit um i mean you said he felt sort of guilty but he didn't really like having money he was trying to spend it as quickly as possible um, meaning what? Meaning well, so, so when, you know, so he wants to help other people, uh, you know, he sort of feels that he's been successful, so he wants to kind of spread it out a bit. Yeah, I think it's a sort of, it's a sort of positive megalomania. It's a sort of control mm. when he needs those people. And then, you know, also dad's disabled down one side and mm. can't drive or didn't actually want to drive. And so, he's, you know, Strangler would drive him and somebody else, you know, there were, all, there were a whole range of characters mm. that, had a kind of arrangement and then yeah. they might get a fancy name or a, you know whatever but they um they, it, it was a, a but dad was definitely at the top of the pile yeah the, yeah um a family of pretty crazy people <laughs> now what about you do you looking back on it i mean there's no sort of the, the book the story is beautifully told there's no sort of self-pity in it or anything i mean but you also were you know pretty delinquent um and a sort of visiting sociologist would probably say to you um are you are you happy <laughs> is there a reason why you are graffitiing all over london and taking lots of jellies and um and not going to school was i i mean i don't know if i was unhappy or not i mean the boundaries were a bit sort of uh I'm not clear, I guess, and and then probably undiagnosed syndromes at school, not being able to concentrate, mm. and then having a very obvious other options. But my mum was very, I mean, what you consider normal. She was an mm. artist, and she wasn't interested in any, any of Dad's um, behavioural and and sort of narcotic. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't she wasn't interested in that culture yeah. in any way. And they'd mm. split up. So we had two households, my sister and I, and we were very lucky because mm. we had a very supportive and normal-ish 
not like no families are that normal, but a yeah. normalish mm. system of life. And then when that didn't work, I kind of fled to dad's. Mm. Dad's was an easier, a cathedral of chaos and, 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 and freedom, but which also has many boundaries in another way. Yeah, so that, it, the, that sort of feeling of freedom must have been quite exhilarating as a 14-year-old to sort of bring your friends around and then not know whether your dad was going to start borrowing like a sheep or offer you a joint or give you 50 quid to go and get some booze. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, there was just there was a certain age when it was fun and then you may have grown out of it. Or it depends on how, you know, because it's only as fun as the person's being fun. You know, if he was being fun, it was fun, but he was he could turn and that could be, he could become not angry in a physical way, but... He was quite kind of, um, he liked, dad liked to disrupt his surroundings as a sort of masochistic way of off, you know, um, sort of offloading some of the, his own tension and angst or whatever. And that's how he did it. He was very disruptive. Yeah, you say something like, um, you know, he just wanted to create some sort of a drama. It was a drama that he was really addicted to rather than the sort of drugs and booze. And drugs and booze could sort of, he liked because they created a dramatic situation. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. There was there was all. I mean, and there was a, a type of unique type of um, drama that was no one was going to, no one expected. Mm. He sort of turned the world upside down.